All right, welcome back to CS50. This is the end of week nine, and believe it or not, we have but three lectures left. So there's today, uh, there's Monday, uh, which will be our final uh, new material. The, when, the next Wednesday is a holiday. The Monday thereafter will be a slate of guest lectures by other CS faculty. We'll be talking a little bit about the courses you can take after 50 and what more there is outside of this particular course. After that, we have the quiz. Then we have the week of Thanksgiving, our final lecture that Monday, and then that's it. No lectures after Thanksgiving. I know, so sad for uh, CS50. So hopefully my voice will carry us through this lecture. I actually feel fine, but my voice kind of trailed off at the end of Monday and hasn't really come back. So I'll try to get us through a few announcements here. Um, the first of which is your pre-proposals for the final project are due this Monday via email, 11 a.m. Realize it's meant to be a pretty casual thing where you really just touch base with your teaching fellow and let him or her know what you're thinking. So look at the PDF that's on the course's website under final project for the directions there. Um, we've added to the course's roster of seminars one other. So Apple uh, Computer Inc. is actually going to send one of their own trainers to campus to meet with any number of you who would like. Um, we've listed it here. It's called Software Development for the iPhone and iPod Touch. The date and time will be posted there. Uh, you can still RSVP via the course's website in here. And this is meant to be a supplement to the, uh, ha to the seminar that our own teaching fellows will already be holding uh, a week or so prior. So realize that's now on the agenda. Um, and also, if you haven't taken advantage of these yet, by all means, curl up with one of the videos from years past or this year or drop by in person, and they're meant to seed you with ideas for your own final project. Uh, we have dinner, probably the last dinner, given how quickly term is ending this year, um, will be tonight in Mather. Still time to RSVP at that URL, 6 p.m. You'll meet a couple of other CS faculty who will be there to have casual chit-chat. Mather's Masters will be in attendance, as well as some TFs, myself, and some CAs. So. Um, Halloween is behind us, and uh, I was emailed by one of the course's teaching fellows who delighted, and we delighted, in her choice of, um, of costume for this particular Halloween. Uh, she, our own Rose, went as a ball cat. So here is our own Rose. But what was funnier when she sent me these photos and she gave us our blessing to reveal her costume was that uh, what did she have to eat that day? Well, she indeed had a cheeseburger well dressed as such. So uh, congrats on that particular costume. Uh, all right, so it keeps coming as sort of a surprise to us that some students are surprised that we actually have software available on the course's website, which I'll visit on this one here. Um, among the juicy opportunities here, a lot of it, most of it, is actually freely available software. But thanks to some uh, friends that we have in industry, Microsoft, VMware, and others, um, you can actually download, for instance, Windows 7. So those of you with PCs who would actually like to uh, get the hell out of Vista and start putting Windows 7 on your computer, it is now available available there. Um, just follow those directions. But more exciting than that is a project that our own Yuki Yamashita has been working on. Oops, just spoiled it. Um, so we hypothesize or we realize that despite years of promoting tools like Shuttle Boy or other apps that students in this class have, uh, have invented for finding shuttles, you know, it's still a relatively slow process to send a text message to S Boy or to pull, call CS50 Voice or certainly to pull up that big piece of paper that shuttle services distribute. So the quad itself has actually been distributing for some time some little pieces of paper that they've nicely printed out with all of the shuttle schedules or with some of the shuttle schedules. Well, because we had this data in our own database and because we being geeks like playing with data sets and trying to visualize it well our own teaching fellow Yuki came up with this much uh, dare say more sophisticated design we like to think it's not blurry in person let's try and zoom out on this <laughs> so what we have here on the left is shuttle boy card the quad edition 2009 to 2010 and it contains all the information that you might want to have in order to go from Mem Hall, from Lamont, from Boylston, from Quad, either on weekdays or if you flip it over, he did one of these London Underground type visualizations of the map itself. So you can find out this and way more than any shuttle schedule you've actually ever seen. And it's even printed on thin plastic so that it will uh, uh, endure your own rugged lifestyle. So what we're going to do, if you would like this kind of uh, the souvenir from the course, uh, when you exit today, quad people should exit that way, river people should exit that way, and our own teaching fellows will hand you out uh, a card if you would like. And you're welcome to grab one from a roommate or a friend, since we have uh, plenty. <laughs> so. Uh, just a little something off our CS50 production line. In fact, coming soon, more on this in a week, um, it's kind of a tradition in the course 
to have a store of sorts. So we do have, as you've seen in the videos of Jansu and others, our own line of apparel. So this too, wait a minute, what's going on? Oh, you got to make fun of me. Looks great to me. Our own line of apparel. So we will soon have uh, such souvenirs as these for you guys as well. Just a little memento. So more on that to come. All right, what else we got here? So the big boards. Um, so uh, Charles, very disappointing performance over the past 48 <laughs> hours. <laughs> Charles has been blown out of the water with a mere $37 billion, up a significant percent. Alan, though, is at the, let's see, millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions, three quintillion uh, dollars. So your classmates have very cleverly, with, a, I dare say, a bit of too much free time, figured out all of the various exploits that you can wage against this big board, which again is meant to be for fun. Um, more holes have been found in it this year than any before. Um, and if you actually click on your classmates' names, you'll see what they're doing. Among the things they're doing is trading things that we probably shouldn't have let them trade, because they're not actually stocks. They're simply mere volumes, uh, which Yahoo happens to conflate as actual changes in price. But power to you. Um, but we did Run, against an run up against an interesting limit. Charles kind of bowed out when he maxed out the size of an int. Uh, I will scroll down here if the internet cooperates. You'll notice that it got curious that if you scroll down here, he started buying only as many as 2 billion shares at a time, 2 to the 31 minus 1. And this was a problem. And Charles very kindly wrote us to report this bug in our system that we didn't support volumes greater than 2 billion shares. <laughs> So we since removed that limitation and are now using long longs, essentially 64-bit shares uh, or 64-bit uh, values. So we'll see how this ends up. We only have so wide of a website, so we'll see how well this works out. Um, but congrats to for those who uh, made it on the big board at all. Even if you were down there at the bottom, that too is to your credit. Um, and we'll probably visit uh, those numbers at the end of the course. All right, so we've been talking a lot about the internet. And we have uh, sort of taken for granted that there's this infrastructure that gets data from point A to B. So what I thought I'd do really quickly is just give you a sense of what it means to go from point A to B. So I've simply SSH to a window here. The font is intentionally small. I'll zoom in in a second. But I'm going to run a certain command called traceroute. Uh, that command is actually looks like my internet connection died there. So let me stall ever so slightly and go to one of the Harvard Computer Society servers here, where I also have an account. And I'm going to go ahead and run a command called trace route, all one word. And then I'm going to type in something like www.cnn.com. Because I know it's a website. Kind of curious as to how I get from point A, Sanders, to point B, CNN.com. And if I now zoom in on this, the output you see from trace route is row by row by row of all of the so-called hops between points A and B. Each hop represents that thing called a router, which recall from last Monday is just this fancy computer, lots of them on the internet, that essentially takes data in and then sends data out. And it might go this way or this way or this way. That's what a router's job is in life, to route data in the appropriate direction. But what's neat about trace route is that you can see every server, every router, uh, that your data, your instant message, your, uh, your email, passes through to get from point A to B. So it's a little cryptic looking, but these are just internet domain names. Uh, at the top left here, we have the very first row, number one at top left, 140.247.something. Well, that's a Harvard address. Harvard actually owns 65,000 plus IP addresses, which are those things that uniquely identify computers on the internet. Um, that's unfortunate. Um, we pale in comparison to our friends down the road, MIT, who actually have millions of IP addresses at their disposal, such that any of your MIT friends are actually welcome to have most as many IP addresses as they want. Harvard is literally running out. But such is the case of the internet today. But that's just one of our IPs. And then each hop thereafter is the name of a router. So the first, number two is core hyphen one hyphen GW, whatever. So GW, gateway, synonym for router. Uh, number four, a three is border. Uh, that just means it's probably a router literally on the periphery, the border of campus. Four is unknown. Sometimes routers just, mm, they don't want to tell you anything about themselves. So you get these stars. But then we get uh, row five. It says quest.net. So this is just a local ISP that Harvard has some kind of connection to, to get data to other people in the world. Finally, uh, we can move to line seven after some stars, still in Quest. And then what city do we apparently end up in in row eight? So San Jose, um, which is actually probably not California, because then in row nine we end up in 
Newark, New Jersey. So I'm going to guess there's another San Jose somewhere, um, but we're staying on the East Coast, it seems, here. And then if you follow the lines, we eventually hit Washington, D.C., it seems. We hit Atlanta. And then it starts to become all stars, which means the routers are just getting quiet or CNN doesn't really want us to know any more details. But it seems a reasonable hypothesis that point B, CNN.com in this case, is in the Atlanta area. Now, how long did it take for data to get from point A to B? Well, that's what these numbers to the right of the names mean when it says 27 milliseconds, it literally means that if you just emailed your friend at CNN.com, that email took 27 milliseconds to get there. And that's damn fast. Like you can appreciate in the real world how many hours it takes for humans to move uh, that distance. But let's try to see even a number that's more striking. Instead of CNN.com, what about CNN.co.jp? So their uh, Japan news office. Let me go ahead and hit enter. We'll see some similar hops initially, because presumably data follows some kind of deterministic path until it reaches the bigger internet. Um, and now we quickly got a bunch more results. Tell me where, let's see, we went from rows 1, 2, and 3 in Harvard, then just an IP address in 5 and 7. Don't know where those are necessarily. And then we get to SJC. So what's interesting between SJC, lines 7 and 8, is that we seem to have gone kind of a distance. Notice in line 7, it took 6 milliseconds to get where we were. Line 8, how many milliseconds? So 35 milliseconds. So that's a distance. So with SJC is probably San Jose, California in this case. People tend to use airport codes for their routers' names just by convention. But what's really cool is what apparently is in between hops 9 and 10. Just infer from the numbers kind of jumps, right? 35 milliseconds to fast forward like 186 milliseconds a couple rows later. Yeah, there's kind of a big body of water. It's the Pacific Ocean. So there are these trans-Pacific and there's trans-Atlantic cables. There's satellites these days that get data from points A to really far points away B. So in this case, you can literally see empirically the actual distance and the body of water that's apparently between us and the Japanese news office for CNN. Because finally, when we get all the way to the bottom, it wasn't a fluke. Pretty much every hop thereafter takes 180 or so milliseconds. So there's a pretty consistent gap between that point A and point B. So I won't show you this whole film, but if you like this kind of stuff, there's actually a fun movie we've linked on the course's website to something um, some folks from Ericsson, the uh, mobile company, years ago made. I thought I'd give you this little one minute teaser of how things really work underneath the hood. It's sort of half fun, but half serious. There's some juicy stuff in there. So uh, give me one second to give us some audio here and... So it is actually interesting, the five minute version of that video, if you are curious how the internet really works underneath things. So we've had a uh, uh, number of problem sets, the last of which is coming up very soon. So problem set eight will in fact be your last. And let me just make one mention, because it's kind of historically the case for any class that allows you to drop P sets, that a lot of people cut that last corner at the end of the semester. They figure, oh, my grades are fine. I'm just going to you know, enjoy this last week or focus on other things. That is your prerogative. So the course will just drop your lowest P set score. And if it's zero, that's the one that'll go. But just do realize that you've come so damn far in a course like this that it would be a shame we, the staff, feel to cut this final corner. You've got PSET 7 due Friday, or you can take a few late days. PSET 8 due next Friday, and that's it. And it's in PSET 8 that you'll finally get a really good taste of what web development is like, what client-side programming with JavaScript, and this technology called Ajax, which we'll talk a bit about today, is about. So realize that uh, it may very well be your biggest regret in life to not submit PSET 8. So <laughs> K 
consider, uh, consider that. Now, as for PSET 5, you know, we're kind of sad that no one's really uh, stepped up and emailed the uh, head teaching fellows with some answers. So you probably recovered about 51 or so photos for this problem set. This, of course, is uh, Happy Cat here giving a lecture. Uh, somewhere on campus. Uh, zooming out, you can see really the context in which he's in. Uh, but I thought I'd take, oh, damn it. Oh, there we go, no, we're okay. Yeah, you can see. Wrong screen, I thought. So I thought I'd give you a chance to uh, ask a question. Is there anyone you're struggling with that we can push you in the right direction with? <laughs> Has anyone even tried? I know a couple sections have tried, because I've been photographed here after lecture, and the TFs have been hunted down in their houses. Yes? The one, oh, the cat on the tree, all right. So sure, we can indulge in this for just a second. The cat on the tree was a little later. Oh, this is cute. It's the only apple tree that I've ever seen on Harvard's campus. And it is near, the hint is, where do all pre-frosh go and behave really nice and positively at? Uh, that place, that area. All right, so go there. Any, uh, one more hint. One more hint. The guy with the, oh, right here. Oh, take computer science one if you want to know that answer. Or look it up in the catalog. <laughs> All right, one more, one more. Because we took up a lot of time taking these photos. <laughs> Any more? This one, actually, one of my favorite, if only because it's sort of a faux animation, was this one. <laughs> So you can just take him anywhere. All right, so anyhow, hopefully that's a little bit more of an incentive to take a stroll. It's a beautiful day out today. You still have until the last lecture to do that. Um, so realize that's a fun way of wrapping up the course. All right, so finally, let's come back to where we were, which was websites. And the motivation for last week in this is really to take the training wheels off and help you realize that after this course, you don't need someone handing you a 20-page PDF to actually get something interesting done. You can learn this stuff yourself, whether it's PHP, XHTML, SQL, JavaScript. But we'll empower you with some final skills this week and next in order to do so. Um, some of your classmates, though, posted what we greatly enjoyed as the sort of canon of good web design uh, on the bulletin board just the other day. I thought I'd share this for you, if only to incentivize you to check the bulletin board a little more often. Uh, it's uh, re elections just happened, and one of our uh, own, uh, uh, oh, actually, someone is running for 2010 here, a Republican, who um, should not have been let near uh, Nano to make this particular web page. So this is his um, platform, apparently. Oh, damn it. I can't. <laughs> I never learned. All right, let's re uh, rewind. So if you had been checking out the course's bulletin board, you might have clicked a little link like this. George Hutchins for US Congress 2010. <laughs> Real quality. What's funny is that instead of having people endorse him, he's endorsing Fox News at the top of this. So um, you don't normally see things like that. So, and worse, and this one I've been warned actually crashes some people's browsers. So beware what you do with your newfound skills. There's this one too. Which apparently they wanted to embed a YouTube video right there for some reason. And then there's a whole lot of quality content here. You go down here. Wait, wait, but this is only the, whole, the vertical scroll bar, because we have this. <laughs> so if you're looking for a template for your new web page, there you go. All right, so we got to get serious here. Um, OK, so in all seriousness, we covered a lot in the past uh, several lectures. Let me pause and see, are there any questions, conceptual or otherwise, so that we're not forging ahead today with too much more stuff before you get some big, important question answered? So no shame in raising your hand. If you just have a question, you think it's a dumb question, that's cool. Let's field it now and bring everyone on the same page. Maybe that was too much emphasis on asking a dumb question. <laughs> no? Nothing? We're good? All right. So. Uh, it's up to you to pause us. So we promised in the last uh, examples from last time that we were going to finally move to more seamless user interfaces. So the theme with uh, problem set seven is pretty much to mimic our approach 
of the login example. You've got a login.php, and that submits to login2.php. We recommend taking register.php, turning and uh, making a register2.php, and you have these pages leading from one to the other. And we promote that, especially for those of you who have never done web stuff before, because it's a pretty simple mental model, right? You fill out a form, you click submit, you're whisked away to another page, and that other page is what implements the logic, whereas the first page is what implements the form. But we saw on Monday that, or last week even, that you can actually have PHP files or forms submit to the same page so long as you put your PHP logic at the top of that same file. So we looked at a couple of Frosh IM's examples that did not submit to a new file, they submitted to themselves, and we just had a condition at the top that said, if you've been submitted to, do this, else show the form. So it's really up to you for PSET 8 and uh, your final projects, if you do something web-based, what approach you like, but PSET 7 is generally pretty simple. But it's certainly not very elegant, especially when you're used to websites these days that are far more seamless. And so what we promised at the end of Monday was that we could start doing things like this. I'm going to pull up an example in the Ajax directory for which you should still have a printout. Ajax 1 kind of took a baby step. <laughs> that sounds stupid. Kind of took a baby step um, toward doing a slightly more uh, seamless interface because you can type in something to this form like Goog, a stock symbol, click get quote, and it does get submitted but I don't get whisked away to a new page. Instead, apparently, I somehow submitted a form, someone answered my query, some server answered that query, gave me back a response, but then I, the very same web page, grabbed that response and presented it to the user in this little alert pop-up. But the key takeaway was that the URL at top right never actually changed. So let's take a quick peek underneath the hood. I would say that these little pop-ups are not terribly common, but they certainly get the job done quickly. So let's at least look at this first simple example. So this is ajax1.html. Let me fast forward to the form. This is all it took for me to whip up this very simple web page. But notice that I've done a couple of new things. What is absent, or rather, what is empty quotes right now? What attribute? So action, and our action is normally the thing that says, what file should I submit this form to? But in this case, I don't want the browser to submit the form in a typical way, so I actually don't really care what the action is. I left it in because for my code to be valid XHTML, uh, the W3C standards, that entity that sort of dictates what the web look, should look like underneath the hood, um, it's, they say you need that attribute, but they don't say I have to put a real file name there. So I'm just leaving it blank. Because instead what I'm doing is I'm using another attribute. An attribute that's called an event handler. So I can actually use things like on submit, a special attribute that kind of does what it says. On submission of this form, what should happen? The function called quote should get called. And in fact, it looks like a function call. Quote, open paren, close paren, semicolon, return false, semicolon. Well, why the return false? Well, what I want to do here is when this form is submitted by the user clicking the button or hitting enter, I ultimately want to say, no, don't submit that for real. Don't submit that sort of 1995 style to a new web page. Let me intercept this submission and call this function quote instead. If I instead return true, the form would get submitted as usual, as though there were no JavaScript uh, or function calls here at all. So in fact, this function here, quote, is a snippet of JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript now is a client-side programming language. So again, and to recap, what that means is it's executed by your own browser. It's not executed by the server. And the advantage of this is that you can still change the user's interface once your web page has been downloaded to their screen. So JavaScript can get embedded into a web page like this. The, again, the uh, tag that I'm using here is script, and this is the new thing that I can put inside my head tag in addition to title. This is just some syntax that tells the browser, don't get confused by the following. This is code. This is not XHTML. So if you see things like less than signs, greater than signs, don't confuse those with tags. It's probably just math. So what am I doing here to make all this happen? Well, here's my quote function. Uh, it takes no arguments. And there's a few new pieces of syntax. So unfortunately, the various browser manufacturers were never on the same page initially as to how to implement Ajax. So Ajax is a technology that essentially allows web pages to make additional HTTP calls, web calls, from browser to server 
after your web page has loaded. Right? Up until now, all of our examples have involved uh, clicking a link, pulling up a web page, and then the little globe or whatever in your browser stops spinning because the transaction is complete. And if you want to make another HTTP request, you typically submit a form or you click a link. What's cool about AJAX, this technology, which is more of a buzzword than anything, it's not a language you learn, it's just using JavaScript in a different way. With JavaScript, can you make additional HTTP calls and grab more data on demand? And that's how Google Maps works. When you click and drag the map, you gr briefly see those gray squares because Google hasn't yet downloaded those graphics, those tiles for that portion of the map. So Google wrote some JavaScript that talks back to Google.com and says, give me more tiles from the Northwest Quadrant or wherever. And then the JavaScript embeds that additional data in the web page. So how can we do this? It's actually relatively simple. We use a line of code code like this. Uh, XHR, could have called it foo, doesn't matter, but uh, in general, this stands for this, XML HTTP request object. For now, we won't go into much detail about what XML really is or what an object really is, because the course is focused not on uh, object-oriented programming, but on procedural programming, if you've, heard the, if you've heard the two terms. But what that means for us is, for now, just take the syntax on faith that this is a little something new that we need to do. So how can I start making additional HTTP calls from browser to server, I need to execute this line of code. But there's a problem, and that problem in this case was Microsoft, because Microsoft decided, no, 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 if you want to actually make additional HTTP calls, then you can't use that line of code. You have to use this second line of code. So this line of code that mentions this technology called ActiveX object is just the Microsoft way, at least for earlier versions of Internet Explorer, that you begin to gain access to this functionality. So for our purposes, just take on faith if you want to use this technology called AJAX, whereby you can make additional HTTP calls to the server you just kind of have to copy paste code like that. But notice what I've done, XHR, this variable, which just stands for XML HTTP request, notice that I defined this variable globally. I defined it inside my script element, not inside the function itself. So, OK, so at this point in the story, and by this point I mean right here, I now have a variable that allows me to make more HTTP calls to the server without the user necessarily realizing it. But I do do a sanity check. I make sure, you know, if this person's running like Netscape 4.0, you know, 1.0, I don't want them to just have some weird, unpredictable experience. Let me check for null, because if XHR is null, that means uh, this thing called Ajax is just not supported by your browser. This probably won't happen to most users today, but if you're on a mobile phone or a Blackberry that just doesn't and support some of this stuff, you might very well run into this. So rigorous error checking, as always, is a good thing. So there's not much more to my code. The next thing I do here is this. And it's wrapping a little bit. So let me just hit Enter for a moment. I'm declaring a variable called URL. Because what URL do I want to get? Well, the context here was this very simple application. When the user hits Enter, they've given me a ticker symbol. I need to look up this current stock price. So what I'm going to do is steal our trick from Yahoo. And I'm going to actually say, Go to the URL, quote one.php, question mark, symbol equals, and then in JavaScript, the concatenation operator is plus. In PHP, it's dot. In JavaScript, it's plus. Same exact thing, though. And then what am I doing here? Well, this is one new trick. Because I want to pass to the server via get, that is via a URL uh, request, I need to get the value that the user typed into this form. What, how do I gain access to Goog? Well, let's take a quick look at the XHTML, because we must have overlooked something. Ah, OK. So notice that besides just putting this form in here, because I don't want the form to actually get submitted, I will still want it to uniquely identify this field. So I use this trick. I gave the input element an ID, a unique ID. Now, it's kind of silly to say it's unique, because there's really nothing else in this page. But for much larger websites, it should be unique. So symbol is the key word I want to use in my JavaScript. Because when I call this line of code, document.getElementById, what you're going to get is the element whose ID is symbol. Now, that's an object in memory. That is this little uh, text box in the browser's window. We actually want its value inside of that box. And so the syntax, as we saw Monday in JavaScript, is to use the dot notation there. So in the end, I first get that object, which is the text box. Then with the dot operator, I get its value. And I concatenate that string, G-O-O-G in this case, to the end of this URL. Because my goal, ultimately, is to request of the server a file called quote1.php, question mark, symbol equals goog. OK? So finally, 
how do I make this request? So first, I tell the browser, when you're done getting this request, call this event handler. An event handler is just a function. So in other words, when you're done making this call, get back to me with the answer by calling a function called handler, which I will write for you. Finally, these last two lines simply send the request. So these two last lines open a connection to the server using this method called get, using this URL here, and then it sends the request. And for the curious, if you were using that thing called post to do much bigger operations, photographs or private information, something like that, you would instead put post here and you would put the post data here. But I'll wave my hands at that for this example. So what does this mean? I click the button submit. I've typed in Goog. The, the submission is intercepted because of the onSubmit handler, and my function called quote is called. My quote function grabs that text field, grabs its value, appends it to the end of that URL for quote1.php, and then because of this open code and this send code, it makes a request of my, my server, cs50.net, and then hopefully the answer comes back. Well, when the answer, let's see what actually happens. Let me go ahead and simulate this. I'm going to copy the URL into a new window, and I'm going to go literally to quote1.php, question mark, G-O-O-G, enter. What actually comes, oh, sorry, thank you. Quote symbol equals G-O-O-G, so that's what I'm about to hit enter on. Hit enter. And what I get back is just a very simple page. Let's look at the source code. There's no HTML. There's nothing in there. It's just a number. So apparently what the server responds with, thanks to quote1.php, is just a number. So my goal in life now is to make sure my JavaScript grabs that response and just shows it in a little pop-up. So how do I do that? Well, here's my handler function, and it's very short. Notice I do two sanity checks. First, I check if this object, which I declared earlier, XHR, if it's in the state number four. So state number four is just the value which means good things happened, you got back a response. So that simply means that the uh, request was actually successful. So if it's successful, I then check for this. Was the status of this request a value of 200? So four means I've gotten a response. 200 means it's a good response. What is 200? Well, have you ever visited a web page? For instance, uh, cs50.net slash complete nonsense. Enter. You get something like this, not found. What do you see in the title bar, though, of a page like this? So 404, you've probably seen this number somewhere, whether it's in the title bar or in the web page itself. 404 means file not found. You might have seen other things like 500. 500 internal server error means David screwed up the configuration of the server a long time ago and never realized that what you should see there is a pretty page saying, sorry, file not found. But the 500, the 500 means I made a mistake on there. But there's other codes. 403, which some of you might have seen already with your own cloud accounts. Anyone know what the 403 code means? It says forbidden, usually. That's when you've messed up Chamad. It just means you've missed a step with Chamad. So Chamad is, relates to 403. 404 means the file doesn't exist. 200, though, is a good thing, and you never see it because you shouldn't. If good things happen, you get back a web page, there is no error code to show you. So if we got back a response, code is 4, and the status of that response is good, 200, what do I want to do? I simply want to call a JavaScript function called alert, and I want to pass to that alert the string that came back. So how do you get at the content the server has responded with? It simply is this notation. The name of the object you use to get the data, dot response text. And now notice throughout this code, incidentally, all this capitalization, the T there, uh, the E here, and the B and the I, it's important. So a very common mistake, especially for the first, doing this stuff for the first time, is to screw up capitalization. Always check something simple like that. So at the end of the day, it's pretty underwhelming, right? OK, wow, that's a great, great website. Much more common these days to, is to actually embed the answer in the web page for the user. So here I have a web page whose source code is still pretty simple. Let me scroll down to the XHTML. And notice that what is in my web page at the moment is the following. Again, a symbol field that says ID equals symbol. So I copied and pasted that. But notice the one interesting difference. Notice I now say price, and then I have this other element span. 
So you've seen me use the element called div, which says here comes a division of the web page. Here's a big rectangle, put some stuff in it. A span is the same idea. Here's a placeholder for some data, but it doesn't force it to be on its own line. A span is what's called an inline element, whereas a div is a block level element, which just means a div takes up the whole width of the page. A span just goes where you put it. So notice that the text I've put there in bold is to be, literally, to be determined. So my goal with this version of the code is to actually type in something like and not get an annoying pop-up, but rather actually integrate the response into the, come on, into the, where were they, into the web page. Okay, so internet was slow, so who knows what that was, but uh, not a bug. Um, what happened here, price got embedded into the web page, but what's interesting is this. Let me actually go into my source code, view page source, scroll back down, and what's interesting is that the web page still says to be determined. So this is kind of an interesting thing. JavaScript, again, is a language getting executed by the browser. And yes, it can change the state of the world. It can change what's inside the browser. But it doesn't change fundamentally what the server originally sent to the browser. That's why we still see the original example. So how did I do this? Let's take a quick look. This is ajax2.html. Let me scroll down. This is the same exact code we just looked at in the confines of the browser. My function's again called quote. Let me look up at quote here. All right, quote, let's see. This is copy paste, all the same. Ah, uh, notice, you know what? I kind of, uh, let's see, nope, that's actually the same. I just uh, wrapped on one line, same, same. It's only the handler function that's different. So the one difference in this version of code, and let me fix the spacing because the font is again big, is this. Instead of calling the alert function, which is kind of a, a weak attempt to implement a user interface, what I did this time was this. I again used this function called document.getElementById, but I got this element with the ID of price. Well, what is that? Well, let me fast forward to the bottom. Ah, that's the span. So the reason I use this span element is because I just needed an XHTML tag that has a unique ID that, yeah, has some temporary content to be determined. But I need to be able to clobber that content. And the syntax for clobbering original content is simply this. Get the element. And this line of code, get element by ID of, uh, ID of price, that gets me that span, that location in the browser. And then inner HTML, capitalized as follows, says go inside of that element, so the original HTML, and you know what? Ah, thanks to the assignment operator, clobber it with whatever the server has returned in that particular variable. So same exact code, I'm just putting the response in a slightly different place. Any questions? OK, so a little basic, but we'll go from here to doing interesting things with maps in just a bit. But why don't we take our five minute break? All right, so let's spruce things up a little bit. So it's very common on websites today that when you visit them and the website is using this thing called Ajax, that you get some kind of progress indication. Like, how many of you have ever used uh, kayak.com? So kayak.com is a wonderfully useful site for finding like um, airline tickets and hotels because it's a meta search engine. It searches all these different sites. But what's interesting about Kayak is that they were one of the first a couple years ago to really push the limits of this technology called Ajax. And Google was another with Google Maps and similar. So to be clear, JavaScript is just an interpreted language. You can embed it inside of web pages. It gets executed by the browser. You can clearly manipulate the, pic, uh, the window itself. You can clearly trigger pop-ups and such. AJAX stands again for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. What does that mean? It's just a buzzword that says you are using JavaScript uh, asynchronously. What does that mean? It means you are using JavaScript to make additional HTTP calls. And they go about their business. They do, what they, uh, they do their thing. And then finally, the response comes back. There's the asynchronicity. You say, go do this. And then you return, like we did in our quote function. We just That was it for the quote function. But when the server's ready to get back to us, it invokes our uh, handler function, thanks to my having registered that event handler, and my handle function gets called. So again, Ajax is just about this dynamism, thanks to being able to make additional HTTP calls. So I went ahead and did this. I wanted to get some sense of progress, especially when the server's slow, so that I'm not scratching my head wondering, is the web broken? Is my computer screwed up? Or did I make a mistake? So in this example, it works fundamentally the same, but when I click Get Quote, it pro uh, puts up this somewhat 
cheesy progress bar. Um, as an aside, it's very easy to find your own cheesy progress bars. If you Google Ajax progress bars, you'll get to sites like this. And if you really want to procrastinate sometime, you can do this and then you can colorize the thing, SF, uh, download it, then SFTP it up to your account and have great fun. There's some quality. So that's where I went for my particular progress bar. But how did I do this? Well, let's take a quick look. This is Ajax3.html. And again, to be clear, all of these files are just .html. I'm not even using PHP yet, um, at least in these files. I did use PHP in quote one. .php, right? Just to remind you from last time, quote one.php was a pretty simple file that looks like this. Uh, I just grab, a, I use uh, the same code. Uh, I actually stole this code pretty much outright from pset7's distribution code. You may recall that there's a bunch of functions and helpers.php that we give you. I kind of uh, extracted the code I want. But notice the interesting thing is that I'm dynamically creating a URL that hits Yahoo Finance, and I'm appending my symbol uh, uh, after the S parameter. Then I'm getting back the response. And long story short, the whole purpose of this little file, quote one.php, is to hit Yahoo and then just spit out the appropriate stock price. That's it. And more on that in pset7. So what about this progress bar? Well, let me scroll down and look at my XHTML. Oh, and this is interesting. So even though when I visit the page, it's not there, notice here's this please wait.gif. So if I visit this thing here, let's see, please wait.gif. So that's please wait.gif. OK, so there's that icon. And in fact, it seems to be embedded in the web page itself. If I view the source of this web page, scroll down, well, notice that at the bottom here, I have please wait.gif, roughly in the middle of that H XHTML. But what element is it a child of? What element is it nested inside of? What kind of element? So a div, right, so the parent element, so to speak, this is just a tree. All this hierarchy this is just making a tree. So the image element for please wait.gif is inside of that div element, which apparently has an ID. So that means I probably am going to go after that div somehow. But notice in the style attribute, this is a little CSS, cascading style sheets trick. I can put this element there, but that directive, that property display colon none, the, what that's doing for me is it's saying put the element here, but then hide it. I don't want to see it, but I want it to be there. It's essentially hidden, but it's not taking up any space yet. Because what I later do in my JavaScript is, in my JavaScript here, I scroll up, and let's see, all of this code is actually the same. There's really no, nothing to look at, oh, except for this line. And I point it out with a comment, show progress. So the moment I construct the URL, I then show a progress bar. How do I do that? Well, let's see. I call document.getElementById, quote unquote, progress. So that's a familiar construct now. I've used it like three times. And now notice, you can change, as I promised on Monday, the properties, the CSS properties of elements using JavaScript. The syntax for that is grab the element itself using like doc, get document, uh, get element by ID. That gives me the object that is that div. Dot style means go inside of that object and start accessing its CSS styles. What property do I want to change? I want to change the property called display. What value do I want to give that display? I want to give it the opposite of none, which it currently is. And in CSS, the opposite of none for this is block. And I used that word before. It's a block level element, so I want to show it as a block, a big rectangle. Um, so I change it to block. So all that's happening here when I actually click submit is what the JavaScript is doing is it's toggling that CSS property, and it's just revealing the element that's already there. And an animated GIF is just an animation. The animation didn't start when I clicked that button. Rather, it's been animating ad nauseum. I'm just seeing it the moment I actually click that button. It's actually still there. So we actually use this in the CS50 app. If you go events.college.harvard.edu, You'll notice that if you look up an event like, um, what's interesting here, marketing, exploring careers. If I click on this, notice that a lot more information appears. And Google Calendar does the same thing, right? This is modeled after Google Calendar's agenda view. So if I click this again, it goes away. And this is actually the same exact trick. When you pull up a bunch of events on this calendar, everything comes down, the titles and the dates and times, but also the paragraph or more of description for each of those events because what I wanted it to do was the moment the user clicked, I didn't even want to have an annoying progress bar. I wanted the feedback to be immediate. So you click this. What's happening is it's not hitting a server. 
It's simply executing a couple lines of JavaScript that say make the following row, the row below me, uh, display block instead of display none. Click it again and it changes it back to none. So again, by understanding these basic building blocks, a little CSS here, a little JavaScript here, a little XHTML here, you can start to make what really are today's modern interfaces with these very simple uh, pieces. Now what's different here about quote 2 is that I did actually return a bit more information. So notice in quote 2.php, and again more on this in pset 7 zone helpers.php file, notice I decided I don't want to just return the price, this time I'm going to return a little more information. I want to see the days high, the days low, and the price. So quote 2.php now actually returns some XHTML. Not a valid web page, not an entire web page, just a snippet, but that's okay because clearly when I click in the symbol like Yahoo, click get quote, notice that the moment it's done calling, I get in the bottom the updated stock price. So how am I doing this? It's probably identical to the example before. Let me scroll down to my handle function and oh, look what I'm doing. One new thing, when my handler function gets called, that is when the server gets back to me with an answer, I essentially assume, okay, I'm done showing this silly little animation, so let me hide it again. I use the exact same line of code, but change the value over here from block back to none. And then I just insert that thing into inner HTML, just like before. So the rest of the code is actually identical. All right, so that's the third version. Um, any questions? on what we've just done. Because I know we're throwing a lot at you, but hopefully little bite-sized pieces here and there that you can refer back to. Any questions? No? It would really help me out if you ask some questions today. No? All right, I'll keep talking. All right, so Ajax 4. So let me show you one other piece of syntax. And you'll actually get more of this kind of sophistication when it comes to syntax in a class like CS51. So again, in a couple weeks, we'll have a few faculty come by, give a little talk about what's in CS51, 61, 124, 171, whole bunch of directions you could go in. And what we'll soon put on the course's website is a little summary of the courses you can take thereafter. But a little teaser here in JavaScript is something that's called an anonymous or a lambda function. So these don't define the entirety, certainly, of CS51, but you'll see these features in other languages. And that's what's kind of fun about JavaScript for us. You're kind of getting sneak previews in this last um, week of web stuff of features in other languages, objects, and in this case, anonymous functions. So let me actually, before looking at that, let me go back to the, our very first example, Ajax1. So, you know, I've been kind of a good boy here, practicing what I learned in CS50, breaking my code down into multiple functions, each of which is kind of bite-sized and implements some basic functionality. I had a quote function, I had a handler function, but arguably, it's kind of stupid to have a separate function called handler that is only called in one place. I'm not reusing this code, I'm simply telling the server, call this function handler, but no one else needs to call it. So why do I have to go through the trouble of commenting it at the top, declaring the function and the parameters? It just feels like a lot of unnecessary work. So in fact, you can avoid something like this, and this is arguably a little more elegant, by no means necessary, but elegant. So down here, recall that one of the things I did before was I registered this handler. So on ready state change, let me go back to the first example. The very first had that same line of code, but I did this. I said, when you are ready to change state, that's all that long named uh, property says, call this function. So what I kind of want to do, you know what, is I kind of want to take this code that's down here and let me just cram it in up here and not even give it a name. Because there's kind of an elegance about that. If you just want to execute some code later, just give me the code. Don't give me a function name. Don't give me a list of parameters. Just give me the code. So what we have here is this trick. If you want to have an anonymous function, one that doesn't have a name but still behaves as a function, you can do this. On ready state change, instead of getting the name of a function, let me just give it the function. So there's this syntax. I can literally say function. Let me actually move this here. I can say function, open paren, close paren, because this isn't going to take any arguments. I'm then going to use a curly brace here, and that means here comes my function. What do I want to do? This code is copied and pasted from version one of the Ajax demo, right? I just grab the, exam grab the response and I call the alert function and it displays the response. So then notice down here, ah, that's interesting. I just have to remember that if I opened a curly brace, I have to close the curly brace. And because this is one big line of code now, I need to put a semicolon there. 
So in short, there's really nothing terribly new with this example. It might look a little weird at first, but the motivation was let's just get rid of the gratuitous name handler and just put the function where I want it. And I offer this not because this is some fancy trick that like the leet kind of used in their code, but this is actually very, very common in JavaScript. And in fact, in Google's own APIs for Google Maps for, project, uh, for problem set 8, you'll see this syntax, but it's really no different from calling a function. It's just you're giving it the function and saying, call this block of code, which happens to be anonymous. It happens to have no name. Well, let's look at one final version of this before transitioning to something more graphically engaging, the maps. So in this fifth and final version of Ajax.html, uh, we have the following XHTML here. So let me pull this up in the browser first. So we have Ajax5.html. I'm going to go ahead and type in Goog again and click Get Quote. And now notice I have kind of placeholders for these things. I, I didn't bother with the progress bar. It's kind of annoying me. But I have three placeholders. So what XHTML element is probably underneath the hood next to the word price, next to the word high, and next to the word low? So what XHTML element? Yeah, so span, right? The last time I needed a little placeholder in line where I just wanted it right where I put it. I didn't want it to fill the whole page, just right where I put it. So I probably have three spans this time. So let me check. View page source. Scroll down. Oh, that's all. So I say sim, uh, price colon, high colon, low colon, and then I have three different spans. And notice I've given these unique names. Lowercase by convention, but they really just have to be unique words. No special funky characters in there. OK, so what's different about this? The difference here, and the reason we offer this simple example, is now apparently I have three placeholders, but up until now, the server's only been returning one response. The first example in quote one, it just returned the price. But in quote two, it returned some XHTML. It returned the price BR tag, the high BR tag, the low BR tag. That's not going to fly now, because I kind of need to be able to pluck from the server's response the price. Then I need to separately pluck the high, and then separately pluck the low, and put them in three different places. So it feels like now I need my server not to just return a blob of text that I just blindly cram into my web page. I need it to return a variable an object, some kind of a hash table, if you will. right? I want to get back three values, a price, a high, a low. So what I kind of want the server to return is something like this. I want it to return, uh, let's say, uh, price. And then it's going to be 1, 2, 3. And then the high is like 1, 2, 4. And then the low is going to be 1, 2, 2. In other words, I kind of want it to return a little CSV file, a little database. Well, what is a database? A database here is just a table. This is why we're using MySQL. It's just a table. So this is just a, a hash table. The left-hand column are keys. The right-hand column are values. And even though problem set six didn't really let you think of the hash table as just two columns, because I mean, this feels a little easy to implement, right? Your hash tables and tries far fancier than this. But just think of this as the, what the user sees. The user doesn't care how many hours you spent on problem set six implementing the fastest hash table or try possible. They just care about putting in keys getting back values, putting in keys, getting back yes or no, this is a word. So this is kind of the higher level view of a hash table. So it turns out with PHP and JavaScript, we can return to the user a hash table containing keys and values. Or more generally, we can turn an object that has keys and values inside of it. So let's take a look. This is uh, quote three that's going to make all this happen. So notice, still, it's pretty few lines of code, but I did a couple of different things. So one, I first queried Yahoo for their CSV file. So again, this is ripped right out of problem set 7. If you haven't dived into problem set 7, that's fine. Just today and Monday will make a little more sense once you do. So this is getting me back a CSV file. But I don't want to hand to JavaScript CSV. I want to hand it an actual hash table so it can just get right to work. So what am I doing here? I'm using this function that problem set 7 uses, f get CSV. I'm doing a little sanity check. Let me make sure that it's not false. Let me make sure it's not not applicable. As an aside, PHP is pretty loose with capitalization. You can say capital false or lowercase false. Even variables don't necessarily have to be capitalized consistently. They should for style, though. So what am I doing? Well, notice I did this little trick here. My goal with this fairly short program, quote3.php, is to return an object. 
Well, what do I want to return as an object? Well, what do I mean by object? A hash table. Well, how do I implement a hash table? Ah, an associative array. So that was just our fancy term for an array that doesn't have to use numbers as its indices. It can use words. So I'm going to tell PHP, give me an empty array. So this line of code says create a variable called quote and assign it an empty array. Put nothing in it just yet. What am I doing down here? Well, if I grab data from Yahoo with these lines of code, notice I just do three things. I index into the quote variable using square bracket notation. I use a key of price. And what do I put there? I put the column number one from Yahoo CSV file. In the field called high in my variable, I put the field number two from Yahoo CSV file. And low, I put the third field from Yahoo CSV file. In other words, I have created an array, aka an associate. Uh, I've created an associative array, essentially a hash table, that puts something like this in memory. That's all those lines of code did. Doesn't look like this in memory, right? You know from PSET 6, really not as simple as this, but that's the mental model. It gave me a, a, a hash table, keys and values. So finally, what do I do? Well, I don't want to return just text. I don't want to return just XHTML this time. I want to return this object. I want to return the hash table. But I've got to hand it to JavaScript in a format that JavaScript understands. And it turns out that JavaScript does not understand Excel files, doesn't understand columns like this, but it does understand something that's pretty much equivalent, even though it looks different. If I want to implement in JavaScript this Excel table, the syntax that I would type in my own code would be something like this, hash table, or rather, uh, var hash table to give me a variable gets open square bracket, close square bracket. That in JavaScript is the same in PHP as saying hash table gets array. Okay, so that's the same thing, different language, you just acclimate to the different syntax over a time. Okay, so that gives me an empty hash table. So what I really want to put in there is a bunch of elements. I want to put inside of there, let's see, I want to put inside of there. Uh, the following. I want my hash table really to look like this. And I'm going to change my syntax just to kind of cheat a little bit. So I'm going to say high colon 123. Uh, sorry, let's do the first one first. Price colon 123. High colon 124. Low colon 122. Close curly brace, close semicolon. And there's differences here with the syntax, but essentially that is how JavaScript would implement this Excel table. So, how can I convert from PHP's associative array, from PHP's hash table, to a JavaScript hash table or a JavaScript object? Well, there's this little function in PHP JSON encode, JavaScript object notation, takes your object in PHP's memory and just converts it to a format that JavaScript will understand. That's all. And this is wonderful because the end result is this. If I go back here and go to quote3.php, pass in a symbol of Goog, so this is the URL I'm about to hit, pretty much the same as before, hit enter, what I get back is this cryptic looking thing. So because, as an aside, I, I misled, I should have said we used the curly braces, not the square braces before. So uh, consider that retracted. So what JSON encode has done is it's taken my PHP associative array, which feels like this. To the user, that's what I put in my PHP code, that effect. But when, the when PHP converts it to JavaScript, it's a little ugly. But notice, open curly brace on the left, close curly brace on the right, and then a whole bunch of key value pairs separated by commas. Now PHP, just to be extra anal, it put quotes around every value, just so that there's no confusion. There's no um, confusion for what's a string or a number. But notice, it's price colon value, comma, high colon value, comma, low colon value. So now I have this fairly rudimentary way of taking data in memory in PHP, massaging it into a different format, an ugly format, but a different format, because I now claim that JavaScript can understand this and convert it into its own hash table with the same key value pairs. So we take this home with ajax5.html. The code here is, again, what we saw a moment ago. Three placeholders for price, high, and low. I scroll up here, and in my quote function, I have hmm, same code, same code. The only difference so far is I'm using quote3.php. So let's see what's coming back. OK, I used an anonymous function again, because eh, I don't really need to give this thing a name, per our uh, argument a moment ago. Same thing, same thing. OK, so the only difference here, and let me fix my indentation for white space uh, for large font reasons, the magic now is in these four lines. 
What again is about to happen? Well, when I go to this page, search for MSFT, get quote from Microsoft, it inserts three different values separately, so that's at least three lines of code. Let's see. Document.getElementById of price, inner HTML, quote.price. Inner uh, get element by ID uh, high, inner HTML, quote dot high, quote dot low. So that begs the last question, what is quote? Well, the first line of code here is the magic. Var quote gives me a variable called quote. This is going to be my hash table, but it's a quote, so I called it quote. Now, this is just a cryptic piece of syntax that this is the way it's done. It's literally something you can copy and paste when mimicking this behavior in the future. I get back the response from the server, and this is the same as before. It's a different type of response, but I know it's JSON because I wrote quote3.php. The way you convert something that looks like a string, something that looks like this, into something that's actually in memory, in the browser's memory, is you take that variable, which is this guy right here. You concatenate to the beginning of it a single parenthesis. You concatenate to the end of it a closed parenthesis. And then you pass that as an argument to a JavaScript function called eval. So eval takes a string of what's called JSON, JavaScript object notation. What is that? Fancy buzzword for this. It takes that string and evaluates it and thereby loads into RAM the actual representation of it in memory. By that, I mean exactly the kind of structure you guys implemented for problem set six. So we've gone from very simple examples where we used alert to much more interesting examples where we're now using this fancy technology called JSON. But what's cool about something like JSON is that when you go to a site like kayak.com and you go to, let's see, I want to go from Boston to SFO. Uh, doesn't really matter when I go. Let's go ahead and click search. I get back their page results. Notice I am now at this page, and it's doing its thing with a progress bar. And notice the results are gradually updating themselves. Well, what a kayak probably is doing, and I, we could figure this out by dissecting things underneath the hood with the tools we've been demoing, what they're probably doing is grabbing more and more data via AJAX, getting back some JSON notation. They're calling a vowel on it, and then when they see a low price, like, oh, $338, they find the appropriate div or the span in their own web page, and they cram that new low price at the top of the page. If it comes back as like $500, they do the same thing, but they cram it down at the bottom of the page. And when you actually apply things like filters, like AirTran only, notice my URL has not changed. There's our 500, don't fly AirTran. Um, Alaska Airlines, all, the web page is changing its interface because of all of these very simple building blocks we're using. And when I say simple, that doesn't necessarily mean easy. But realize we are implementing in five lines of code, six lines of codes, the basic building blocks of all of these sexy websites these days. So let's now make a sexier website. So let's go to, uh, uh, you don't have a printout of this, because I went to press late with this, but it will be posted on the course's website. Not that course's website, this course's website. I'm going to go, oh wait, let's check in with Alan. Yeah, about the same. All right. <laughs> let's go down to uh, source code index. And I have this new directory called map as of this morning. So what's really cool about Google uh, is that one, um, not only do they solve the search problem very well, they also release for free so much fun functionality. So that wiki page we've been er, uh, promoting, uh, fun APIs, this is one of the APIs on it. So Google Maps API, Application Program Interface, is a JavaScript interface via which you can actually embed Google Maps in your own website. In fact, if you go to shuttleboy.com, um, we have a Google map embedded in the website. Kind of a teaser, because I kind of haven't had time to finish it. So when you click on this map, there's my alert box, uh, GPS, coming back soon. We'll do that over uh, JTerm. But you can embed maps like that and make them interactive. So that's what we'll do. So in a nutshell, when you use Google Maps, you've got to do two things. One, you click a link like this, sign up for Google Maps API, and they just ask you, where are you going to use the map? Tell us your URL. And after that, it's free to use. So there's no real registration or money or anything like that. But what's really cool is when you start to read through the documentation, you realize, my god, look how much functionality Google exposes. Now, this is not meant to overwhelm, but this is meant to give a sense of just how much you can do for free with Google's API for Maps. And Yahoo has something similar. Microsoft has something similar. There's many different entities that do uh, offer services like this. So what does it take to actually embed a map? Well, let's take a look. I'm going to go into my uh, map directory here. 
Let me go ahead and change over to the server that I put this on this morning. And let me go into lecture nine source map. And this is map1.html. We'll, again, this will be on the website. So that's it. There's not much code here at all. But if you glance quickly, you'll see a little bit of JavaScript and then a little bit of XHTML. So what does this thing look like? And then how does it work? Here's map1.html. OK, kind of ugly, but hey, it's not at maps.google.com. It's at cs50.net. So that's a step in some direction. It's at least my own map. And actually, wow, I mean, look at that. What is that, 20 lines of code? I made my own Google map, right? Sort of our fake Google maps now. So how did I do this? Well, notice this. At the bottom of this HTML file, I have a body element with two new details. Just as there's an onSubmit handler, which says on submission, do this, there's also an onLoad handler, which says on loading this page, do this, and there's an onUnload handler, which says on unloading this page, going elsewhere, do this. As an aside, there's bunches of other handlers, on click, on key down, on key up, and in fact, any of the fancy websites you've seen today, or even some of the CS50 stuff, if you go to our own Google Maps, and this is actually a canonical example of embedding a map into your own website, if I start typing M-A-T-A, ah, here comes a whole bunch of suggestions. What we did was we wrote some JavaScript that says on key down, check what the user just typed, or probably on key up. The moment my finger comes up, see if we have a match. And in fact, we have a match on Mather. Hit enter, JavaScript executes. We get whisked away to that location of the map, and we get this little bubble. So everything on maps.cs50.net is going to be within reach for you with problem set eight. So what does it take to do it? First, I call apparently a load function, which I'll write. And then I'm just going to call a Google function called gunload. So how do I have access to Google code? Well, notice at the top of my file, previously I've had script tags, which is my own code. You can also have script tags that don't themselves contain code between start and close tag, but instead has this thing, a source attribute that says, go load the source code from this long cryptic looking URL. But where is it coming from? Google.com. And if you're bored later, pull up like Facebook.com and go to view source. Look at the top of the file. It'll look a little messy because there's a lot of content there. But if you look for script tags, you will find that there's a whole bunch of .js files being loaded by Facebook every time you visit it. And that's the same idea here. They've just factored their code out to separate files. So let's see what else is happening. OK, so the entire content of my page is one div. I have a div that I've given an ID of map. I've used some CSS to say make it 800 pixels wide, 500 pixels tall, and that's it. There's no content on this page by default. In fact, if I ditch this load function call and go back to my browser and reload this page, that is my web page. There's nothing there, because apparently the magic comes from JavaScript. So what is my load function? Well, this is pretty much ripped from Google's own documentation. I have a function called load, which I clearly wrote right here. I do a little sanity check, because Google's documentation told me to. It's kind of a long function name, but I'm supposed to call if G browser is compatible. This is a Boolean function, says yes, this browser is supported, or false, it's not supported. If it is supported, what do I want to do? And this is what's brilliant, frankly, about Google Maps and any of these companies' APIs. Two lines of code, literally to embed a Google map in your website. First, I declare a variable called map. I call new gmap2, because this is the second version of the Google Maps API. Where do I want to put the map? I simply have to tell Google's gmap2 function the element that I want to fill with their map, with their tiles. Why do I say map? Because I have a div whose ID is map. So if I had said foo here, I have to say foo here, but I just went with map. Finally, I have to do one last thing. I have to tell the map by way of the dot operator to call this function, set center. So we've seen two things in JavaScript thus far. You can have a variable that's got a property, a value inside of it. We've seen dot value. We've seen dot high, dot low, dot price. But in JavaScript, because it's an object-oriented language, you can also call functions that are inside of variables. So for our purposes, um, it will just tease you with this feature that exists in Java and C++ and C Sharp and other languages. But for now, just know because map is a variable and because we've assigned it the return value of this Google function, that Google function returns what's called an object that has not only properties or variables inside of it, 
but also functions. So this function, because of the documentation, is called set center. Where do I center it? Well, I center it using this syntax. I create a new glat longitude object. This is another function that takes two arguments, latitude and longitude. And how did I figure these out? Uh, I copied them from their documentation. This is for um, Mountain View. And then I went 13. This is the zoom level. So let's just tweak one thing. So let me go ahead and, you know, let me see. I don't know what 13 is. I want to see what 3 is. Let me get a sense of what this means. Let me reload my page. OK, so 3 apparently is way out, whereas 13 was apparently way in. All right, so we're getting somewhere. Really underwhelming to put it here. Uh, I'm just going to take a shot in the dark here. I don't know what this la uh, longitude is. Let's try 137. Let's see where we end up. <laughs> Doesn't exist. <laughs> or it's not on the map. Let's try, let's do, not do something as crazy. Let's do one oh, negative 102 here. Reload. OK, don't know where I am. But we could follow this road and see where it leads, literally. <laughs> So apparently, notice I haven't put any zoom control. So let's actually, let's actually solve this problem. Let me roll back to our original version here. And OK, come on. Let me roll back there and go into to map 2. So map 2 is a little better in that I kept reading the documentation, as you will for problem sets uh, 8. And now notice, OK, it's a little prettier because it fills the window. How did I do this? Well, let's just take a quick glance here. Oh. Pretty easy to have it fill the screen. 100%, 100%, voila. So it's sort of a marginal improvement, but not all that magical. So let's look at the third variance here. Let me open map3.html. OK. Well, that's kind of cool. At least it's now relevant to my life. Right? So how did I do this? Map3.html, I did a few new things. One, I figured out using Google Earth or using Wikipedia, frankly, where Cambridge is in terms of GPS coordinates. And then I replaced the Palo Alto ones or the Mountain View ones with Cambridge's numbers. So these are the latitude longitudinal coordinates for Cambridge. Kept the same zoom level. But then again, I kept reading in the documentation. Because Google Maps, as I know it, has some really cool things like these arrows that let you zoom in and out and pan left and right, change to satellite view. I kind of want that in my own website. Well, how do you do this? You call certain functions that the documentation tells you to. There's a function called gmap type control that if you allocate it and then pass it to another function called add control, this simply adds this thing at the top right. This is the so-called type control. Why? That's what the documentation calls it. If I want to add this zoom thing on the left, I use a gmap large, g large map control and pass it to this function called add control. And then finally, I can't mimic this on my tablet here because I don't have a, a mouse with a wheel, but these two functions also let desktop users use the little mouse wheel and zoom in and zoom out. And it's literally that easy. And this is when I speak to, again, maybe I'm biased being a bit of a geek with this stuff, but the fact that it's so damn easy to just make really cool things really, I think, puts the fun back into programming. So let's take a look at just two, I think, two final examples here. Map4.html has this. So that's kind of cool in that now it's even more like the Google Maps I know. If I click this little red dot, Ah, that's kind of cool. I get a little cartoon bubble with the name Science Center and a link to Wikipedia's article about us. Well, let me go into map four here. How did I do this? And again, I'm intentionally flying through some of this because, again, PSETS 8 will walk you through this. And again, it's really just an RTFM thing. How do I do this? I looked it up in the manual. Well, this is a little more interesting, though. This function, this version of load in map4.html, again, centers me on Cambridge. Uh, it does uh, some fun uh, the zoom level here. And then I call this function called create marker. And I pass it a point. What's a point? Well, this time, I actually saved the return value of glat long. So that's kind of interesting. And let me see how I wrote create marker. And this is syntax that, at first glance, looks a little messy, but we'll just reason through it quickly here. So create marker apparently takes a point, a GPS coordinate, and then it creates something called a G marker. Documentation probably explains that a little more. And now the only thing I have to do, and this is the intellectually interesting part, if I now have the notion of a point and I have the notion of a marker, I, and I also want to create the notion of a pop-up window, I kind of have to wire these things together. And this is a good mental model for programming these days with these APIs. APIs. It's kind of fun because you grab this thing off the shelf, this thing off the shelf, and you, with your own skills and savvy, just have to figure out how to wire these things together using JavaScript, PHP, or whatever. Well, in this case, how am I wiring them together? I'm calling a function called addListener, and I'm telling Google, listen to the marker, the red dot, 
every time it's clicked, call this anonymous function. It's anonymous because I don't need it anywhere else. I'm just giving you the function directly. What does this function do? Well, it's apparently creating a variable called XHTML. Uh, it's storing in there the science center in a bold tag. So apparently I'm making some XHTML on the fly. Plus equals is just the concatenation operator to combine. So it's like doing plus equals, minus equals, star equals, and C. Same thing. So here is the XHTML that ends up in that cartoon bubble. How do I actually open the cartoon bubble? So notice I call map.openInfoWindow8HTML and pass in the point that I was given and I pass in the XHTML that was just created. So now take a step back, because we have some nesting here. This code is not called the moment the page loads, because everything in this yellow bracket is part of this anonymous function, which is only called when the marker is clicked, because the browser was told to listen for precisely that behavior. So the net result is, again, functionality you're very familiar with, something like this, and it pops it up. But there's one, one thing we should uh, finish strong with. Kind of an uninteresting website in that it always does the same thing. Where is the dynamism we promised? Well, if we go to map 5, we need to do this. If I click here, I went back to Palo Alto, because, you know, I'd kind of like, just for fun, when I click on this marker, I don't want some static Wikipedia article. I want the current stock price of Google. 542.72. Close this window. Now, odds are it doesn't change. Oh, there we go. 542.49. Click it again. 542.49. If we let Alan, get, there we go. 542.40. So now there's some dynamism. Now, even though I haven't revealed what's under the hood, think about the pieces that must be involved. It's the same exact program as map4.html, but apparently now instead of creating a static string, I probably stole some code from earlier today, which is Ajax-like. I make a second call to my own server, quote3.php. I contact Yahoo really quickly. I grab the response. I could massage it into JSON format and then spit it back out. And again, my JavaScript code grabs that price and doesn't just display it with an alert, doesn't display it in a span. Instead, it displays it in an open info window function call. So more on this on Monday. Good luck with problem set seven. Oh. And let me remind you, quad people, if you'd like a shuttle boy card 2009-2010, head that way. River people, head that way.